Then they gave me the details that the person who is going to be buried on Sunday uh, had been married for a month, the guy, with the lady. So he's dead now. He's passed away. It's his funeral on Sunday. That's very painful. You know what's more painful? Is when you, for the get up greater part of your life, tell yourself that one day I'm going to get married, I'm going to be so happy, it's going to be such a beautiful day, and life going on, going forward, and then after a month, the person you've been waiting for dies. So what happens? You never lived your life, you were waiting for that, and you get just a month, and then that's it. It's painful. Now, I, I know it's difficult, but I think we need to try, and I think this is what God wants us, wants from, from, for us. Um, and I know some of you may not really easily agree with me on this one, that God does not want us to go to heaven so that we can be happy. He wants us to be happy so that we can go to heaven. Waiting for this to sink. I know it's been a long day. Um, <laughs> let's say that again. God does not want us to go to heaven so that we can be happy. Not be miserable. Don't worry. I'll make you happy in heaven. That's not God. And that's one of the reasons why people are running away from God. It is, it is because there's this theology of the miserable now and the happy later on. It's not in the Bible. Of course, the Bible deals with also challenges that we have in this sinful world. But the Bible also makes it clear that God says, I'll give you peace that passeth understanding. In the new Jerusalem? No. Now. I've come that, 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 I've come that they might have life and have it in full and have it abundantly. Next, tomorrow, in heaven? Now. God does not want us, he does not promise us joy in heaven. He does not say in heaven you'll be happy. He says, I want you to experience joy now so that you will Look forward to heaven. So that heaven begins here. And then because you've experienced heaven here, you want to go to heaven. Take the story of, 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 of Israel coming from Egypt. They uh, were slaves on their way to Canaan. And you can almost tell that the theology then would have been easily that Guys, let's be strong, let's be courageous. We're going to go through the desert, we're going to go through the wilderness. It's going to be hard, it's going to be hot. Um, but at the end, at the end, we're going to have Canaan. At the end, life is going to be so wonderful. I don't know why we don't have our... Okay. I don't know why we don't have our title here. Okay, there's it. Um, life is going to be so wonderful. Um, so they're going there through the wilderness, dying... Uh, don't worry, even if you are dead, one day you'll be resurrected. So you bury that one and you go. <laughs> you see the Canaanites and the other people, no, or the Philistines or whoever on the way, Moabites. says, yeah, you can laugh at us, but one day we'll be happy in heaven <laughs> or in Canaan. That's not what's in the Bible. I mean, God led them. He, he made sure that they conquered their enemies on their way to Egypt, so on their way to, to Canaan. He even organized water for them in the wilderness. He didn't say, don't worry, you will die of thirst, but in Canaan, there will be enough water. He organized water in the wilderness. He organized warmth in the, in the wilderness. There was a cloud of, of, a pillar of cloud to keep them warm during the night. It was in the wilderness. They, they had manna, they had bread. They wear, the, the shoes they wore never, never, what's the word, um, um, they, they, didn't, they, they never worn out. I mean, like you were seven when you left Egypt. And now you are 42, but you're still wearing the same shoe. <laughs> I mean, think about it. It's like as you grow, the, 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 the shoe also adjusts to your size, you know, right through. There was no Woolworths or Edgars or whatever shops you have here in Perth uh, in the wilderness. But the story is, on the very day, the eve when they were going to get into Canaan, Listen now very carefully, because we've got the whole flowering of this theology. On the eve, just before they got into Canaan, everything stopped. No manna, no water, everything stopped. You know why? Because they were going to get it in Canaan. It's 
livestock. Because now you're in Canaan. So what did God actually do? What did God actually perform? He brought Canaan into the wilderness. And as they were walking to Canaan, they were walking in Canaan. <laughs> to Canaan. So that when they arrived at Canaan, so there was no need for them to have all the things. So he had SMS, WhatsApp, the environment and the, and the whole atmosphere of Canaan so that they can be able to get to Canaan. Because without Canaan, they would not be able to get to Canaan. So Canaan had to be created. So you see, one of God's greatest challenges is not taking us to heaven. It's for us to accept heaven now. That's God's challenge. That, guys, I want you to experience this thing. Now yeah, I'm in the, in the street by and by. Okay, put that aside. I want you to experience this thing now. So that as you experience this thing, you can actually say, this thing is true. I read a statement from Ellen White uh, where she said to parents, we're going to talk about parenting tomorrow. And those who, don't, who, are not, who do not have children, who are children, they must come because we're parenting you. Don't say I'm not a parent. We're parenting you. So come in and help us do this thing uh, correctly. She makes a statement, and I'm going to paraphrase. She says, don't let your children be afraid of going to heaven because you will be there. In other words, your kids must never get to a point that, again, we're going to have this thing again in heaven because things were so bad on earth. Now they're going to be with you forever. In heaven, they're going to go through this thing again forever. They say, we're not going to heaven. Now, my point here is, if heaven is what I'm experiencing now, and what I'm experiencing now is not good, I'm not going there. You, get, you, you see the, the, the reverse? If, if heaven, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm laughing at this, but if heaven, but I'm very serious, if heaven, if heaven is like, We're going to be singing holy, holy. Listen, guys, I like singing. <laughs> but I don't want to sing holy, holy for, forever. Honestly, I mean, I can't. I, I, for me, it's, once you say that, I just don't want to go to heaven. I, there must be some learning and research done in heaven. I can't just be singing. There, there has to be some... That's not what we do on earth. We don't sing right through. Even in church, we sing and sit down and we reflect and we talk. We don't sing. But why must we sing right through in heaven? From morning to sunset, we sing. Ah, ah, ah. <laughs> oh, okay, that's me. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm not a good singer. Singers would like to sing forever. I don't know. But I used to practice. I used to go to a practice and we sing. They put a one sheet of item music that we need to practice. And they... We go all over these things forever. Like we do it again and then let's do it again. I said, no. <laughs> we can't do this. I mean, I would think that you can't do this on Sabbath. This is serious work. I mean, this thing is not, we're not enjoying this thing. We're not supposed to be practicing on Sabbath. Sabbath is a day of rest. We can't be singing this thing up. up. Let's just enjoy ourselves. Can we please do that? I said, no. We need to perfect this thing so we can enjoy it when we sing it. Ah, that's too late for me. <laughs> that's about it, beloved. That's what I want to say now in the next 30 minutes. I'm just going to repeat what I just said and just give you some bullet points. That you can, something you can carry home, something you can put on your tape. But that's basically what I'm going to say. And I might not, it might not come out the way I want it to be because we are human beings and our, and our expressions are always limited. But you get the gist that honestly, God wants to shower us with heaven. God wants us to experience heaven here on earth, so that heaven may actually be a very relevant place for us. And I'm talking that to young people. If God says don't, if God says do, it is because he wants to create heaven for you here on earth. And if you can understand it in that, in that context, you will, you will do yourself a big favor. All right, let's, 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 let's look at, uh, there are three, when we talk about singles, me, myself, and I, just you, yourself, um, even those who are married, they will, they will, they will uh, resonate with this. Um, we, we're basically looking at three groups, and I'm not going to be addressing this group, and I'm addressing that group. I'll just be talking principles, sharing principles. And whoever is in whatever group, you'll take what, what is fitting to you in whatever group you are in. Are we together? I'm not going to say now I'm, I'm talking to you now. I might be making examples, but generally I'm just going to be throwing things, and then you can pick up what's relevant to you. Fair? All right. So let me just to let you know that I'm aware that 
There may be some of us who are single and but hoping to get married. There's nothing wrong with that. Pastor, please pray for me. I want to be married. I want a good husband or I want a good wife. Nothing wrong with that prayer uh, as long as you are good. As long as you are a good, a, a, good, a good partner to that person that must be good. You don't want criminals praying for good wives. And, <laughs> and there are those who are, who are single by choice. I don't want to have anything to do. I'm too busy to be really babysitting another person or whatever. I just want to focus and do God's work or whatever and be a blessing in this world. That's also beautiful. Nothing wrong with that. And then there are those who were once married, either because of divorce or death. They are widowers or widows. And um, they may still want to get married or not, but they may even have the scars from the previous, previous relationship. And um, they may be here and we can, we'll have something to say to them as well. Or they will be able to pick up something from what we are, we are going to say as well. Um, but let me, let, me, let me just say this. Um, um, I think this will apply to all the groups or maybe to some of the groups that we've just mentioned. That is, marriage is good. I'm not saying yours is good. I'm just saying marriage. <laughs> Don't look at me like, what do you mean? <laughs> I'm not talking about your marriage. <laughs> okay, you can delete that, that comment. Marriage as, a, as an institution created by God is good, all right? Let me give you some of the research. This is from this book by uh, Gallagher, Wait and Gallagher, the, the Case for Marriage. This is what he, sorry, this is what he says. This is what they, he says here. Yeah. That starting at a baseline age of 48, I mean, you know, there's a lot before 48 that naturally you, um, you can really sustain yourself to that point. But if we start at 48, where the rubber missed the road, <laughs> If you start at 48, and if you are married, 90% of the men will still be alive at 65. 17 years later, you'll find 90% of those who were married at 48. When they not necessarily married at 48, but when they were 48, they were married. You'll find that uh, at 65, 90% of them will still be around. 10% will be dead, not because they are killed by marriage, but they'll be, they'll be dead. But we are talking about marriage. But if unmarried, if using the same baseline, if they are not married, 60% of them will be alive at 65. <laughs> now, you can, you can extrapolate as much as you want from that. that. Oh, one of the things is that, that when you are married, there are more reasons for you to live than when you are not. I mean, if you, if you have your car and your sound system and things are so bad, those are not enough to sustain you and want you to face life and be courageous. But when you have a child at primary school, when you have a child who's about to graduate, there are many reasons why you would like to fight and live. You get what I'm trying to say? So, so married people, in a way, um, uh, at, 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 this, at the same age, you'll find more of them than the rest, okay? I'm not going to say much on that. Married women tend to be healthier than single women. And are hopefully happier also. Um, Married women tend to be healthier. Plus, I mean, there are many reasons why you have to be healthy um, as a, as a, as a, when, you are, when you are married. Uh, you think about those reasons. For women, wedlock increases the likelihood of surviving to old age from about 80% to more than 90%. So if you are married, so chances are, I mean, here's the thing. And I, I mean, this is statistics. There will always be those who, are not, who don't fall um, in, that, in that category. But if you're looking for uh, people at an old age, like 80 years, most of those are married or were married. You hardly find single people who have been single right through at 80. They are there, but they're not too many. Are, are you with me? Who have just been single from day one up until 80. Single. I, I'm, I'm, I'm not talking about people who lost their partners. I'm just saying single. They will still be there, but not as many as those who are married. Maybe your argument might be, even from the start, it's because many were married and there were few singles. I take it, all right? So I'm not going to argue against that. But the point that I'm trying to make here is marriage is good. Created by God is a blessing. I mean, it, is, it just creates this motivation for purity and morality. This, this, this industriousness, uh, this ability to work and, and to, to be productive. 
because you have a home that you are going to. You've got to work, you've got to produce, you've got to send your ch children to school, you must earn money. Actually, other stats uh, show that uh, uh, even men who are married are usually more wealthier than those who are not married. You tend to save more when you are married than you would if you were not. If you are just single and no, no one, no parents, no one just you, by yourself, what, what are you saving for? Saving for a car or whatever. But when you, are, when you are married, there's so much that you think about. And that may tend to make you even more wealthier than those who are single. But it is also a fact. You know, there's those of us who may choose not to want to marry. It's not because there's not anything wrong with marriage. Um, it is good. Created by God, God says this is good. But it is also a fact that, uh, um, I thought we were going to have that uh, uh, slide there. The, the, the faces of this angry couple, uh, for some reason, it didn't come up. But there's a lot of sadness in some marriages. I mean, people die in marriage. And said, if he did not marry, I was at a funeral, beloved. And there were two coffins, two coffins, the husband and the wife, same day. And the wife was killed by the husband, and the husband killed himself. So we're sitting there, said, we wish that this wife would not have married this husband. She would be alive. So we blame marriage. But we want to be able, before we get excited about marriage, that don't marry out of desperation because you're going to marry a criminal. You're going to be in that coffin. I'm not saying that's the reason, but I'm just saying some of the habits, some of the things that get exposed later on in your partner, were there when you married him. Actually, the parents knew. Um, uh, when they were talking, the parents of the men who killed, they said, we know our son, what he's capable of, and we are not surprised that he did this. But we did not know that he was married to this one because he never told us. We would have told her not to marry him. So the parents know what kind of a person their child is. But there are some parents who hope and pray that when, when their criminal marries an angel, the criminal becomes an angel. The criminal kills an angel in most cases. So that is why it's very important for us to be very sober when we get married. Very sober. I know we lose it. This thing called love is like a drug. Oh, I, I just love him. Shut up. All right, so there is that possibility as well. So we, just, we don't just celebrate when you say, I want to get married as if all is going to be well uh, going forward. It, it can just be the start of misery until you get to a point where you say, I hate the day I got married. I hate it. I even hate the pastor who officiated. <laughs> All right. So how then do we go around? How do we... Uh, now that we know that marriage can be both, it can either be a blessing or a curse, then the whole thing reverts to you as a person who chooses. What are you going to do? What do you do with yourself? What do you do with, with yourself? If, and we're going to be throwing some few ideas. Now, before we do that, let's just create a base here, uh, a foundation for some of the things you're going to say. We had already touched on this thing yesterday, that therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be one flesh. We're not talking about marriage, but we're talking about the process here, that you shall leave. There's an assumption here that uh, if you're going to leave your father, that you are able to leave. It, it doesn't say, uh, therefore, uh, a man shall be brought by his father to his wife, because you won't be able to walk. So you will leave. You know, there's going to be a decision to say, Daddy, um, uh, my parents, um, it's been nice. We, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm starting a home. That means there's, a, there's, a, there's an assumption here that you are matured, you are at an age, you are able to stand on your own. You are no longer a child. That's the process I'm talking about. That some of us are not able to cleave because we have no ability to leave. We have no strength to leave. Like L-E-A-V-E. -E. We can't leave because L-I-V-E, -E, we are not leaving. So my argument is, for you to be able to fulfill that at some point, or even if you're not going to fulfill that, it doesn't matter, but you must always be at a state that where you can be able to cleave. So that not cleaving or cleaving should be a choice. It should not be because you are disqualified. Listen, 
Even if you, as a single person, you say, I will never get married, but you must have the qualities of a person who can get married. So that not getting married should always be a choice. When you say, I will never get married, you say, now we, we know why. I mean, it makes sense. <laughs> we shouldn't say that. We shouldn't say that. We should actually uh, say, oh, man, what a, what a, what a, what a, what a loss. Because we, we, we can actually see that you have all the ingredients. So it doesn't matter even if you're going to marry or not. It's important for you to be able to leave your parents. Even if you're not going to cleave. But not cleaving or cleaving should always be an option. That I choose not to cleave, but I can leave. L-E-A-V-E. Because I L-I-V-E. Now here's a triangle. Let's look at this thing. And then, and then later on we're going to see how it connects. So there's living here. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, maybe, maybe we can even do it better and do it like this. All right. Um, there's living, there's cleaving, there's one flesh. Um, for those who actually want to end up here. But as I argue that even if you're not going to get here, even if you're going to get here, but this thing must, must be there. You don't need to be a child for the rest of your life because you're not planning to get married. Because if you're a child, you're not going to contribute much into this world. We don't remember much about children except that they were playing and crying. But if you're going to be living a life that's meaningful and impactful, you've got to be able to reach that stage to some, at some point. So, so, so in, in the case that you want to get married, it will still apply that you must be able to live if you want to cleave. And some of the reasons why people are, are not able to cleave, it is because they're not able to live. They are not able to live, and as a result, they are not empowered to cleave. You can't cleave because you are still bringing your whole family. You're not able to live. You are so part of your family. And sometimes not because of your fault, but because your parents never allowed you to exist. Because they were afraid that if you live and you become your person, they are going, their existence will be threatened. So they've always subsumed you and submerged you into their own existence. So you, don't, you are not there. So that when you get married, you are taking all of them into that marriage. You can't. Because you can't be on your own. But this thing says, yeah, hey, you've got to be able. I think as parents, we'll talk about that tomorrow. The best thing we can do for our kids, we said that yesterday, just bring them to be the individuals, individuals God created them to be. And somebody says they, they are, they are not, they are, they, they, children come through us. They come through us, so we give birth to them. But they were, they were, they were in God's mind before they, they were in your womb. <laughs> so please allow God's design for your child, that, that was there when he, he, he had this concept of your child, to be, to be fulfilled. Don't, don't stifle it. They're, they're, not original. they're not originating from your womb. They came through your womb. They were there in God's mind before your womb was formed. It's in the Bible. So what a joy to participate in this process of bringing another human being to fulfill God's design. So when I handle this bunch of humanity, this bundle of humanity, I must say, God, what's your desire about this child? What do you want this child to be? And I want to cooperate with you so that your dreams about this child may be fulfilled. Every child you carry is a Samson or Samsonite, whatever feminine gender you can put there. But every child, there's a purpose, and that purpose resides in God's mind because that child came through you, not necessarily from you. So we should be able then to create that situation, that uh, environment where our kids will be able to live. But unfortunately at times, some of us want to cleave because we want to leave. We don't leave so that we can cleave. We want to cleave. No, no, no. We want to leave. That's why we, we want to cleave. So cleaving is not the goal. The goal is leaving. <laughs> so you're not applying your mind to the person you are marrying. All you want is to leave those that are there. I just want to move away from my parents. I don't care whether I marry a tree or, a, or whatever. But as long as I have an official way.